Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Most sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Immaculate heart of Mary, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you one of my best friends. Father Ken Geraci and I met a few days before Christmas in 2003. Some of you probably weren't even born yet. Father Ken is a Texan. He's a graduate of Stephen F. Austin University down in Nacogdoches. Very proud of that. He and I were members. You can see he's wearing the Father of Mercy badge a few years ago. And this is the way I used to dress every single day. But God said, no, we don't want you to be with the Fathers of Mercy. And so I left the Fathers of Mercy, and that's when I came to the Diocese of Tyler and was ordained a priest for the Diocese of Tyler. Father Ken, of course, persevered with the Fathers of Mercy. And so, Father Ken, I'm so happy for you to be here. This is such a great honor for you to be here today. And thank you so much for your attention to give him. Father Ken has one of the best vocation stories you've ever heard in your life. Father Ken Geraci. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Ooh, that's, let's try that again. Good morning. Good morning. There you go. Um, let's see here. So where should I begin? It's good to be with you. It's good to be back in Texas. Texas is a good place to live. Amen. I'm going to say many things today. I'm going to tell you a bit of my story, a bit of my past. But if you only remember one thing I say in this whole presentation, do these, I'm going to be with you guys in the next couple days too. I'm going to come visit your classrooms. I'm going to disrupt your class so you, that means less schoolwork for you. Amen? <laughs> but it's all for Jesus. Amen? Amen. All right. So I'm going to say many things, but I only want you to remember this one point. If I meet you one year, five years, 10 years, 20 years from now, and you say, Father, I saw you at school that day, and I'm gonna ask you, what did you remember from that? This is what I want you to remember. You ready? The only important thing in life is to go to heaven. Make sense? The only important thing in life is to go to heaven. If we wake up every morning with this mindset, that the most important thing is not what's going on in our world, in our circle of friends, or globally, but rather that the world is not good enough for us and that our hearts will not be satisfied until we rest in heaven. How will that affect your life? How will that change the way that you respond to certain things in the world? So I want you to keep that in mind, that the only important thing in life is to... <laughs> The only important thing in life is to? I'm not convinced. See, this whole group over here is sleeping, right? The only important thing in life is to? Amen. So, um, I grew up, uh, just a little bit about myself. Um, I wasn't always a priest, and I'm here to talk with us this week about vocations. And so I'm going to share a little bit of my story over the next 15 minutes, and then I want to open it up to you for questions regarding our faith, vocations, things like that. If you don't get to ask your question today, or you want to, would rather write your question down, we can answer that when I come to your classes uh, tomorrow or the next day. But when we talk about vocations to the priesthood to consecrate a religious life, we have to recognize that it's not a matter of trying to figure out what I want to do in life. What do I want to do? What do I want to be? But rather is that when you were conceived, God himself was present to knit you together in your mother's womb. God has a plan for each one of us. God has something in store for you, something incredible whether it's to religious life, whether it's to the priesthood, whether it's to the married state, whether it's being a consecrated single. So all of these things God has in store for us. So the question is, is that discovery of what God has created us for? And I can tell you, God has created you not for comfort, 
God did not make you to be comfortable, but he made you for greatness. See, this world has so many great, beautiful things. This is what I love about our faith, that it's both faith and reason. You can be an amazing scientist and a priest or a religious. You can be an amazing scientist and an incredible Catholic. Being good at one will make you better at the other. This is my favorite line in our faith. So, I never liked our faith, to be honest. Uh, I grew up in a nominal Catholic family. I was baptized, we went to church every Sunday. My biggest accomplishment as a Catholic was that by the time I was confirmed, I memorized when to sit, stand, and kneel. I thought I was a great Catholic. Whenever I went to Mass, I was bored out of my mind. Couldn't stand Mass. Couldn't stand faith. CCD, I would rather die than go to CCD. You, I can't tell you, to, oh, I'm having a heart attack. I can't go to church tonight. Right? How do you go from faith, mass, CCD, how do you go from all of that, being the absolute worst part of your week, to now being the absolute joy, love, and highlight of my day? The answer is simple. We have a crucifix, one encounter with Jesus. One encounter with the risen Lord Jesus Christ is enough to change a man or a woman to make them do the craziest things. Do you realize I was on a date when I realized I was supposed to be a priest? Okay. Hashtag worst date ever. <laughs> See, I grew up in this nominal Catholic family. My family, we went to church every Sunday, we dressed apart, but we never prayed together. And because my family didn't pray together, we did not stay together. My parents' marriage ended in divorce my senior year of high school. It was challenging for me. But for me, I got to play my mom against my dad and quit going to church altogether. I'm very scientific in my thinking. I love astrophysics. I love those great, the, the real cosmology, not Discovery Channel science. That hardly counts as science, but real science. Um, during seminary, I took a course at Yale University on the contemporary problems in modern astrophysics. I was so excited. It's so wonderful. But I'm a big geek. Never underestimate my geekiness. It's wonderful. So I love, I got this scientific mind. And because I'm investigating these things of science, I begin to ask this question. How can all of these articles of science be true and God still exists? So I concluded in my own mind that because science is, tr is true, God can't exist. And I became agnostic at this point in my life. My desire in life was to be very successful, and that meant the amount of zeros at the end of my paycheck. So I went off to Stephen of Austin State University to work on my business degree. Uh, my senior year of college, any Lumberjack fans here? Any Lumberjacks? Anybody in this family? We've got a couple Lumberjacks. Lumberjack. There you go. Excellent. So, I'm off to Stephen of Austin to work on my university degree in business. My senior year of college, there was a computer company locally, and they had an advanced research and development group. I was recruited out of school my senior year. That meant I was going to school full time and working full time. And they invited me to work in this advanced R&D group, and we were doing research and development on these little devices. I don't know if you've ever heard of them before. They're called MP3 players. So way back then, before most of you were born, I'm working on this technology. We didn't invent it, but we were one company among many trying to develop products for this. Our claim to fame is that we had the very first working prototype of what is today the iTunes store. So we're developing this technology, software, hardware products, and incredible. It was neat being in the advanced R&D group because I had the first of everything. Okay, the iPhone 10 just came out, right? All y'all excited about that? Well, imagine already having the iPhone 11. Ooh. See, we had all of that new technology first. My boss had an idea for a new computer company. So he invited me and six other guys to work with him on this project. And again, I had just graduated college at this point. Now I'm just down to working a full-time job. But we began to work nights and weekends on this project. So we would work our regular job from basically 8 till 6 in the evening, and then around 7 or 8 o'clock I'd go to my friend's house, and we would work from 8 till about 1 or 2 in the morning on this new software company. And we did this for about a year, year and a half. After this time, we presented our idea to a venture capital company, and they liked the idea so much they gave us $4.5 million to fund our little company. Now, 
Here I am, I'm like 25 years old, 26 years old. My ego is the size of this building. Huh? I mean, I'm making more money than I know what to do with. I, I've got a truck that I can go as fast in reverse as I can go in first gear. I mean, that's important, right? All, right. All these incredible things, material, uh, business accolades. But, and I'm perfectly happy. I, am, I mean, I am living the dream. My boss comes to me one day. Now, I've been working with this man, Mike Kupka, for quite some time now. And Mike is a devout Catholic and a real friend of mine. This is, I'm going to boil down many, many conversations into this very simplistic presentation of it. But effectively, Mike came up to me and he basically said, professionally, I have no problem with you. But personally, I do. You know, I've been working with you for now for many years, and I've heard you tell people that you're a Christian. If she's cute, I've heard you tell them that they're Catholic. Hmm? I've heard you tell people that you're a Christian, that it's convenient, you're Catholic. But you've told me you don't go to church, you don't pray, and honestly, Ken, some of the stories you tell are unbecoming a man, let alone a Christian. So which is it? The first thing I want to point out is that is a real friend. Amen? Amen. Because he encouraged you to be a man. Again, is being a man or a, a woman Duplicity, or is it letting your yes be yes and your no be no? Again, this is the beautiful part of a friendship is that a real friend can come up to you and tell you, hey, you're off track here and you need to dial it in. Or you're doing things that aren't good. Again, you're doing things that are hurting others and yourselves. So Mike challenged me in that. And so, but not only did Mike challenge me to let my yes be yes and no be no, he invited me to come to church with he and his family. Now, Mike is one of the most brilliant men you'll ever meet. This man is already, his last company he's, they've got right now, he was making, uh, I said, how much, he goes, how much are you making now, Mike? He said, um, around $3,000. I said, $3,000? He says, $3,000 a week. Right? Not bad, not a bad, you'll pay, keep the lights on, right? And so, this guy is, but I see him kneeling before God. And this is the man that I've got the greatest respect for, and he's more brilliant than anyone else I've ever met. And here he is believing in God. And so I begin to see this reality that God could be real. But again, my scientific brain was doubting. Again, my roommate at the time was Baptist. So I started going to the Baptist church with my roommate from time to time to kind of see what was going on there. And so I started going to the Baptist church, the Church of Christ, the churches I lovingly refer to as Six Flags Over Jesus. <laughs> you guys have those theme park churches around here, the Church of Fire, right? And so I'm going to all of these different churches, and I'm beginning to experience the reality that Jesus Christ is Lord. See, I never knew that. I never had that experience until now in my mid-20s. This concept, I've heard it. I, we've all heard that Jesus Christ is Lord, right? Amen? So, we've heard it, but the question I want to ask is, do you own it? And you don't need to respond, but do each of you, individually, separately, do you really know Jesus? Have you encountered Him personally? Have you felt that love He has for you? that encouragement he has for you. And when I say love for you, it's not that fluffy love, oh, Care Bears, there's a banner on the wall that says you're so special, and oh, that you sit here and snuggle. No, no, I'm talking about love that says, let's go out and conquer the world for the kingdom of God. Let's go out and do great and amazing things. Let's be the best person that you can be, and let me lead you. Be a man in my image and likeness, Jesus says, not in the image and likeness of the world, but of mine, of the divine image of God. The word that was made flesh. And so that was a question that I never addressed or sought to answer. And I want you to think about that. Do you have that relationship with Christ? Do you know his love for you and are you trying to nurture that on a daily basis? I was at Hyde Park Baptist Church in Austin, Texas when my life was changed. I'm doubting God's existence but flirting with the idea that he is real. And the youth minister stood up and he said, and he was preaching, he was just giving it his best. I mean, he was all fired up. He's like, yeah, and I'm like, Ugh. And he said, listen, if you want to change your life forever, 
do this. Pick up the New Testament and read one chapter of the New Testament every day. If you do that, it will change your life. Now, do you know how long one chapter of the New Testament is? Sometimes it's a half of a page. Other times, the long chapters are two pages of the Bible. Real simple. So we're talking anywhere from two to five minutes a day to change your life. He said, and if you doubt God's existence, start in the Gospel of John. And I'm like, ooh, he's talking to me. And so you know what? I said, I'll take your challenge. I'm going to try this for two weeks. And when you're wrong, I'm going to come back and I'm going to thump you on the head with your Bible and tell you that I don't have to be a Christian because it's not real. Well, guess what? We owe Hyde Park Baptist Church in Austin, Texas, a huge debt of gratitude for my vocation to the priesthood. This is the incredible part of our faith, is that again, when we look at the life of Jesus Christ and living it in the scriptures, and when we take time to give ourselves to encounter him in the word of God, it can change our life. But the beautiful part of our Catholic faith is that we have so many different ways to encounter God. So first, through the scriptures, second, through the devotions, such as the rosary. You know the rosary, we just call it the pocket gospel. It's a meditation on the 20 mysteries of the life of Christ. And so again, we get to pray and meditate on those things, focus on those things. Again, we're so scriptural as a Catholic community. So again, I'm beginning to experience Christ in these different churches, and I begin to ask the question, which church is true? My Protestant friends would say things like, Ken, we non-Catholics, we Protestants, we all disagree about small things. But those Catholics over there, they're completely wrong. I said, oh, okay, good, I'll just write the Catholic Catholics are completely wrong. And then I begin to study. Then I begin to ask that question because I'm hearing different teachings in these conflicts. And I begin to study and ask that question, what did Jesus do? And as I begin to see the history roll out, not just from a biblical perspective, but from a Jewish perspective. Yet here is the second principle that I teach whenever I travel. I get these missions when I travel. The most, in, the most important thing in life is what? The most important thing in life is to? Go to and then the second principle I teach is that in order to understand much of the New Testament, we must think like Jews. We must have a Jewish mindset when we read the scriptures, much of it, because Jesus is speaking and to understand what it means to be a Christian community, to be a church, we have to see it through the lens of the Jewish faith. So as I begin to study these things and enter into these things, I begin to see the reality of what Jesus did in establishing his church. And not only with the church, with structure, hierarchy, and liturgy, and the beauty and the treasure that God has revealed. And so as I'm beginning to come to start to understand this, I'm up at Stephen F. Austin State University. Now, this is how bad I am as a Christian, okay? I am well, probably the worst, like, practicing Christian ever. So I go to, I'm going to Stephen F. Austin. I'm, I'm just graduated, and there was this really cute girl. I can tell you her name. Her name is Cynthia. Oh, gorgeous. So Cynthia comes up to me one day, and she goes, hey, there's a retreat this weekend. You want to come on a, a Jesus retreat with me this weekend? And I said, uh, no. <laughs> no, that's not my thing. I don't do retreats. I don't do happy clappy, and I don't do hand holding or singing. She said, well, no, no, we're, it's, just, it's just gonna be us kids. We're gonna be group. Oh, oh you're gonna be there? Oh, no, I love Jesus and everything. Yeah, no, no, I'm all about it. Yeah, sure, we'll come out. Yeah, hallelujah and all that business, right? <laughs> and so I get out to this retreat, and here comes her roommate, Gretchen, up to the end. Hey, Gretchen, hey, where's Cynthia at? She goes, oh, um, she asked me to give you this note. A note, huh? Sorry I can't be with you. Have fun on your Jesus retreat. <laughs> not happy. Not, this is the not happy face, okay? So I'm, I'm so upset, I'm furious. I'm like, oh, I got suckered into being here. And so the whole retreat goes on. And Saturday night, and I'm the worst kid on the retreat. I'm like, just, oh, it was horrible. So uh, if, if any of you struggle, believe me, I know where you have been. And let me help you this week while I'm here. Because this is an amazing life. 
So the Saturday night, the priest says, hey, if you haven't been to confession in a long time, if you need to make a change, if you want to put an old end to the old and start something new, come to confession. You know, just renounce your sins and start fresh. I'm like, all right, I'll go to confession. So I sit down, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. I knew that part. And I'm sitting there and he goes, you know, awkward silence. Because I didn't know what I was doing in there. I'm like, hello. He goes, how long has it been since your last confession? I said, I don't know, I think 15 years. This is my fourth confession ever. So now I'm 25 years old going to confession for the fourth time in my life. And, I, and the priest was all excited. He's like, yes, yeah, we got a big... We get excited when we get people who've been away from the confession for a while. And so he, we call them big fish, you know, it's like fishing. And so I make this confession, this whopper of a confession. And at the end of it, the priest said, Thanks be to God, your home. And he asked a weird question. As a confessor, I don't think I've ever asked this before. But he said to me, he said, what do you think your penance should be? And I'm glad he asked, because this was my response. The Holy Spirit moved in me. I said, well, he said, what do you think your penance should be? I said, well, I don't know the Our Father or the Hail Mary. Maybe I could learn those prayers. This is how basic I was in my mid-twenties. I knew nothing about our faith. But the simple act of faith, of going to confession, to try to seek to live my life, to do it God's way, not my way, it began to change everything. And then my life continued, and, and we grew the business. Um, we ended up selling it off. Again, we didn't sell it off for millions and millions of dollars. I didn't, I'm not a millionaire, or never was I. But, but when we did finally sell off the business, I'm beginning to live my faith. Okay, and this is again, I'm trying to condense a lot of things into one story here shortly. But as I begin to live my faith, I really think to myself, what do I want out of life? Where do I feel God calling me? And I said, I want to be a husband and a father more than anything else. And then the question that came to me was, if I met the woman of my dreams tomorrow, would I be ready to marry her? And the answer came back a resounding no. I wouldn't be ready to marry her. Because I was thinking to myself, if I was a husband and a father, I would be praying with my spouse every day. I would be praying with my children. If I was a husband and a father, I would be going to church every Sunday. If I was a husband and a father, I would be doing this and not doing that. And again, I wasn't doing anything horrible at this time. But again, it was one of these things that there was so much more room for improvement. And so as I'm looking at this, I see that I can be a real man. And I can start living that. And so ladies, let me ask you a question. Just the ladies. Huh? Ladies, do you want, when you're ready to date in like 20 more years, huh? when you're ready to date, do you want to date a man or do you want to date a boy? A man? Amen? Amen. <laughs> Anybody want to date a boy? There's one. There's one raising their hand, right? <laughs> Two, all right, three. All right. No, those are the guys over there raising their hands. All right. So men, the ladies want you to be a man. But what is being a man? Does that mean being macho, being tough, being strong? Or does it mean being a man or a woman of faith? Living your faith and letting your yes be yes and your no be no. Being like St. Joseph, who's a protector and a provider. So again, this is what we're called to be, is to step outside of ourselves. Do we want someone, guys, girls, do we want someone who is selfish or selfless? Selfless. Selfless. Everyone knows the selfish friend, right? And they're no fun to be around. So again, let me draw this together for us. So now that I'm living this, trying to live this authentic life, I start dating this wonderful young girl, perfect courtship, and she calls me one night, she goes, hey, there's a priest coming to my church, you wanna come hang out? And I'm like, nah, not really. Never met a priest that was exciting, that seemed to love what he did, good priests like Father Anthony and Father, uh, Father Breland. What I did is I said, you know what, time with you, time with God, what could go wrong? So this priest was up there preaching of a storm. He was on fire. And I said, my God, I can see the Holy Spirit. I can see God in this man. And he seemed to love his faith, love what he was doing. And I sat back in the pew and I thought to myself, now I'm going to date right now, right? If this man says, I'm signing people up in the back to become priests, I'll go. I don't know what I'll tell Melissa or my family, but I'll do it. 
Within 20 seconds of thinking that, Melissa, the girl I'm dating, leans over, she elbows me in the side, and she goes, hey, are you sure you're not supposed to be a priest? Okay, hashtag worst date ever. <laughs> Friend of mine said she was trying to let you down easy, huh? <laughs> and I froze. And I sat back in the pew and I said to God, if he says it, I go. But if he doesn't, forget it. And the whole mission continues and he doesn't make an invitation. And so I leave that night and I totally, I'm, I'm freaked out. Again, I don't, Melissa, she, we, we were supposed to go out for drinks afterwards. We didn't. I said, I'm out of here. I'm done. You're freaking me out here. And so the thought about being a priest bothers me every single day. This happened in Austin, Texas in November. I moved from Austin to Houston to do some work in February. For four months, that thought bothers me every day. And I go and finally talk to someone about it. And they said to me, which is better for your life? Your plan for your life or God's plan for your life? What do you think? Do you think your plan is better or God's plan? You think? God's plan. God's plan is better. And so that was my response. And he said, so you owe it to God to at least talk to someone about it. So I went and talked to a priest about it. And he said, listen, relax. Becoming a priest or religious isn't an overnight thing. It takes time, it takes prayer, it takes discernment. So the best thing for you to do is find a spiritual director. Would you be open to that? I said, yeah, I can pray about that. I can be open to this. So he writes down a guy's name and he said, here's a young priest down the road. Go talk to him. And so I go down the street somewhere in Houston, Texas, and I knock on the door. He's supposed to be this young priest. And out walks this guy, he's like 65 years old. And I'm like, you're the young priest? Are you kidding me? And he goes, no, 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 hang on a second, kid. Let me go, let me get the guy you're looking for. And I was freaked out. Now, understand, this is only the second or third priest that I've ever spoken to in my life. And I'm like, ooh, and he goes, buddy, he goes, you don't look so good. And I'm like, man, I'm like, I'm all freaked out over here. All right, I'm thinking this, and want to be a husband. And I start dating this girl, and we're at this thing, and I'm thinking this, and then she says this, and now I'm all freaked out. And I'm like, I can't stop thinking about being a priest. And as I'm saying this, out walks that same priest that was in Austin four months earlier. And my mind was literally blown. He walked out and I'm like, are you kidding? <laughs> and he shook my hand and I said, hi, my name is Ken Geraci, I think I'm supposed to be a priest. And so that was the beginning for me and the journey continued. And my brothers and sisters, I gotta tell you, I thought being a priest, being a religious would be the worst life ever. But I've never been happier, and I've never had more joy in my life. I used to have all of the money I could spend, all of the freedom, all of the time, and all of the worldly things I could possibly want. Now I take, I've taken vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, huh? In street terms we say, no money, no honey, and a boss, huh? And so I want to share with you that, that message, that when you follow God, it's not a burden. It's an adventure. And if you enter into it with your whole heart and be open to where he's calling you, it will be an amazing, amazing journey. And you get it thousands of times more than what you could ever have had in the natural level. And this is the joy of the gospel. This is the joy of saying yes to God. It's because he has a plan for each and every one of your lives. So that's my spiel. All right? Thank you.